I had just graduated from my nursing program and was excited to begin my career. After applying to various hospitals, I got accepted by a prestigious private hospital known for its excellence in obstetrics and prenatal care. This hospital was renowned for its surrogacy programs and had a global reputation for delivering the healthiest and genetically superior babies. Naturally, I was excited and eager to start at my new hospital and meet my co-workers. I arrived at the renowned Blessed Wing Hospital right at 9 a.m. Several friendly and cheerful nurses and doctors greeted me, and my attending physician was equally wonderful. I quickly made friends and settled into the routine. Since I was new, I didn't have full access to the hospital right away and needed to earn those privileges. The only thing that seemed strange to me was that I never saw any patients coming in or leaving the hospital. However, I did see many happy couples arriving to adopt their newborns. I never saw the surrogates, either before or after delivery. My job was to care for the newborns and make sure each baby went home with the right parents. Working with such tiny, innocent newborns was incredibly fulfilling. Each baby was perfectly healthy, and they all looked unique, as if custom-designed before birth. However, I did have one major concern about the hospital. Outside the nursery and waiting room, I could hear loud, painful screams from the women in labor. Although the doctors and nurses did their best to comfort them, the screams persisted. Even more unsettling was that these screams sounded less like pain and more like terror. I learned to block them out and focus on the miraculous births. But one day, I heard a woman scream something I'll never forget, why do you keep doing this to me? Please, I want to leave. After working for a few months, I felt confident enough to start asking about the mysteriously absent patients. However, my questions were met with silence and stern looks from both doctors and nurses. Finally, my attending physician pulled me aside and told me to stop asking questions and just focus on my job, assuring me there was nothing to worry about. Despite this, the screams of pain and terror continued to echo through the hospital hallways. I found solace in the nursery, caring for the newborns, but the screams always followed me whenever I walked through the halls. My first year went by without any issues, and I was no longer restricted in where I could go. I had the freedom to move around the entire hospital, but I usually stayed near the nursery or the doctor's lounge. However, my curiosity soon got the better of me. Not long after my one-year anniversary, I was exploring the halls when I heard a woman in labor screaming. It was the same woman I had heard pleading with the doctors when I first started working there. She was now delivering her second baby in less than two years, which was very risky for a professional surrogate. She was screaming in fear and begging the doctors to let her go. I was confused, was she being kept in the hospital against her will? I waited two more weeks before finally gathering the courage to explore the back rooms of the hospital. It was during a quiet night shift, making it easy for me to move around unnoticed. I walked down a long hallway with signs pointing to various delivery rooms and a second doctor's lounge. Suddenly I heard a woman cry out in pain, a sound I had come to recognize as someone in the throes of labor. What struck me as strange was that the cry came from behind a door labeled incubators. I didn't see anyone else in the maternity wing or coming out of the delivery rooms, so I decided to check on her. I wish I hadn't. When I opened the door, what I saw made me feel so nauseous that I can still remember the taste in my mouth to this day. The large room contained about two dozen beds each holding a woman at different stages of pregnancy. The women were all young, from various racial backgrounds, and shockingly, all had their arms and legs amputated. They lay there helpless and alone, with tubes and IVS providing nutrients and fluids as their only means of survival. 
a blonde woman with a hugely swollen belly and a badly injured body saw me and pleaded for my help. Please. You need to help us escape from this place. I was speechless. I couldn't even budge. All I could do was stare at them in shock, my hand covering my mouth. Please, she cried out once more. They won't allow us to go. They keep exploiting us, using our bodies. I stepped back from what I saw and headed towards the door. The woman called out to me with tears streaming down her face, saying, We're stuck. We can't get out. Please, you have to help us. I got really scared and dashed out of the room. I went back to the hospital nursery and couldn't stop staring at the adorable newborn babies lying there. It was hard to believe that such a terrible experiment could lead to this. When my shift ended, I couldn't leave the hospital fast enough. As soon as I got home and pulled into my driveway, I vomited on the grass and started crying for the women I had left behind. I couldn't sleep at all that night. All I could hear were the sounds of pain and desperate pleas for freedom echoing in my mind. Two days later, I went back to work at the hospital and started my shift. As I entered the nursery, my attention was instantly caught by a newborn baby with blonde hair the same hair color as the woman who had begged me for help. I was certain that what I saw was real. I fibbed to my supervisor, telling them I was leaving work early because I felt sick. Once I was back home where I felt safe, I immediately dialed the police and shared with them everything I had witnessed. The police came to the hospital and discovered the horrifying scene just like I did. The women were transferred to another hospital and ours was closed down. I felt relieved and expected to see the story on the news. But nothing was reported. There was no mention of the women who had been rescued from the hospital's human incubators. There was a period in my life when I was addicted to horror movies. Every night I was immersed in the world of horror and mysticism. In those days, when I lived alone, nothing interfered with my movie marathon. I usually went to bed by morning. One day, when I went to bed as usual and turned up the light, I was suddenly awakened by a strange rustling, something like scraping on the surface. At first I thought it was the cats, but both were lying quietly on my feet. I listened and noticed that the noise had subsided. From that day on, I decided not to watch horror movies. But even when I went to bed in the evening, I was still worried. Almost at the same time as last night, I was awakened again by a strange noise coming from the hallway. I didn't dare get up but I was almost certain that the sound was coming from the mirror. It was as if someone was slowly running their fingernails over the glass. After a while, the noise stopped. The next day I decided not to go to work because I felt sick. During the day, I noticed that one of the cats was acting strangely. She was standing by the nightstand next to the bed, looking at her reflection in the mirror. Stayed like that for a couple hours. There was a mirror in the bathroom, too. I had always considered myself brave, but after the horrors I was afraid. Even in the shower I kept looking at the mirror, and all the time I felt as if someone was watching me. When it was time to sleep, fear possessed me, and it was difficult to fall asleep. Suddenly I woke up to a new sound, like a monotonous voice somewhere. At first I thought it was the neighbors, but soon I realized that the sound was coming from the corridor. I tried to make out what it was, but the sound suddenly stopped. Fear took hold of me and I stayed lying there trying to sleep. Finally. To calm the fear, I turned on the light. Toward dawn, I heard faint laughter. In the morning, he decided to change things up and spend the night at a friend's house. But I noticed that the cat was standing in front of the bathroom mirror again. He was indifferent to my attempts to attract his attention, as if subordinated to the reflection. I decided to take a shower, closed my eyes, and suddenly, while standing under the shower with my eyes closed, I saw something in the mirror. An empty bathtub, a shower curtain, and there, Right next to it, a face slowly appearing. A green face with a feral grin. Feeling the creature in the mirror laughing, I flung the curtain aside in horror. There was no one there, but I trembled, felt the presence of something. I don't remember how quickly I got dressed and ran away, but there was a feeling that someone was watching, waiting for something. Before my mom arrived, I tried not to be alone. But even now, when I walk past the mirrors, I think I sometimes hear a quiet laugh. 
The cat continues to sit on the nightstand, staring at my reflection as if he sees something I don't see. Story 2 Since the beginning of last year, I have been plagued by insomnia. I can lie in complete darkness for hours, staring at the ceiling, listening to the clock counting down every second right next to my ear. It was on one of those nights, in the early days of February, when there was deep silence outside and the moon was not peeking out from behind the clouds, that it started to snow heavily. I was in the apartment all alone. Then I realized, how could this child reach the doorbell? Why wouldn't he answer my questions? Where did he come from? There are no children of that age in our neighborhood. These thoughts sent a chill down to my very bones. I was still staring at the boy, and suddenly he contorted his lips, his face darkening instantly. He opened his mouth and uttered, Dante look at me. His voice was hoarse and squeaky, like an old man ass. Dante look, or it will be worse. He added, my mom and dad went to visit my godmother, but they called him to get back home because the buses weren't too running because of the bad weather. I went to bed much later than usual, about 1, 0 in the morning. I usually go to bed earlier since I have class in the morning, but as soon as I lay down and my head touched the pillow, I immediately realized that sleep was not coming. Finally, as before, I lay on my back and lay perfectly still, thinking about different things and waiting for the sky to start getting lighter, because I know that with the first rays of morning light I will finally fall asleep. My mom and dad went to visit my godmother, but they called him to get back home because the buses weren't too running because of the bad weather. I went to bed much later than usual, about 1, 0 in the morning. I usually go to bed earlier since I have class in the morning, but as soon as I lay down and my head touched the pillow, I immediately realized that sleep was not coming. Finally, as before, I lay on my back and lay perfectly still, thinking about different things and waiting for the sky to start getting lighter, because I know that with the first rays of morning light I will finally fall asleep. About five years ago, there was a period of time when my mother would tell me in the morning about strange nighttime doorbells. They would happen deep in the night, sometime between 2 and 3 o'clock. Someone would ring insistently and demandingly. My mom was surprised that no one but her heard these calls, and every time she got up to ask through the closed door, who is there? But there was always silence in reply. Before leaving for work, she complained to my father and me that at night again someone came and called, but never showed up. These strange visits were repeated every week like a schedule. Eventually my mother decided not to come to the door anymore, and the call stopped for a while. I listened, but there was no sound behind the door. Silence. And then I got a chill. A chill. A chill. The bell rang again. I cautiously stood on my tiptoes and looked through the peephole. The corridor was illuminated by the bright light of the lamps. I saw a boy about 10 years old in front of my door, dressed in a simple fur coat, without a hat, and felt boots mittens hanging on elastic bends from the sleeves. He had dark hair, a round face without much expression, and large, pale eyes. There was snow outside, but not a single snowflake on the boy, and his clothes were perfectly dry. He raised his head and looked up, as if he knew I was watching him. I shrieked in horror and drew back into the hallway. At the same time, the door began to scratch, and from behind it came hoarse mutterings. So, 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 so. I stood frozen with horror, not knowing what to do. The scratching and wheezing continued from the side of the door. Lord, I shouted, protect me from the evil power. And I began to make the signs of the cross with a trembling hand in front of the door. Help me, oh Lord, protect me from the evil one. And immediately, as if by prayer, the grinding stopped. Something hoarse hit the door and fell silent. I continued to draw the signs of the cross in the air. I stood like that for another ten minutes. Then I listened. There was silence all around. I didn't he dare to look through the peephole. I went back into the room, turned on the light, and sat like that until I finally fell asleep from fatigue and exhaustion. I shrieked in horror and drew back into the hallway. At the same time, the door began to scratch, and from behind it came hoarse mutterings. So, 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 so. I stood frozen with horror, not knowing what to do. The scratching and wheezing continued from the side of the door. Lord. I shouted, protect me from the evil power, and I began to make the signs of the cross with a trembling hand in front of the door. Help me, O oh Lord, protect me from the evil one. And immediately, as if by prayer, the grinding stopped, something hoarse hit the door and fell silent. I continued to draw the signs of the cross in the air. I stood like that for another ten minutes. Then I listened, there was silence all around. I didn't he dare to look through the peephole. I went back into the room turned on the light, and sat like that until I finally fell asleep from fatigue and exhaustion. Story 3 
What happened yesterday was unfathomable, but for some reason I felt that these women might know the answers to my questions. So here I was again, on the same platform, and I was rather uncomfortable. Why did you come here with flowers? I asked. The two women, who were both in their 70s, began to tell me their story. I was completely stunned and decided that it was high time to run away from there. And so I did, running as fast as I could toward home. The next evening, I was passing by the park again and I unconsciously glanced toward that very playground. There were two women standing there, one holding flowers, the other leaning over and carefully placing them on the ground near the swings. The girl had short blonde hair and was dressed in pink pants and a jacket with a white pattern. It was really hard to listen to her cheerful laughter and songs amidst the woman and sorrowful tears. As the girl ran past, I tried to interest her, to get her attention, but she seemed to be too absorbed in her amusement. Eventually the girl stopped and I walked closer to her. She was looking straight at the ground. Baby, what is your name? Aren't you tired from running around? I asked her, but the girl didn't answer or even raise her head. I sat down beside her to look into her face. What I saw puzzled and frightened me at the same time. Her eyes were surprisingly large and completely black. Suddenly she blinked and her lips moved slightly. When she spoke, her voice sounded low and rough, as if it were the voice of the devil. It was about 8 o'clock in the evening when I got home from driving school. I warmed up dinner and sat down to watch my favorite TV series. After watching the last available series, I found out that new episodes would not be released soon, which made me a little upset. I tried to find something else to watch, but nothing piqued my interest. Pushing my plate aside, I decided it would be better to take a short walk and headed to the nearest park. The feeling of an ease came over me again. I really wanted to help this woman, to calm her down, but I didn't even know how to approach her. I tried to talk to her. But she continued to ignore me, not responding to my words. She kept repeating the same phrases, as if she was lost in her grief and sorrow. When I had already exhausted all my comforting words, a girl caught my attention. She got off the swing and started running around our bench, humming a tune from a children's song. I usually felt calm and safe in the park, but that evening was an exception. As I passed the first playground, hidden between the trees, I felt a vague uneasiness and a slight shiver ran through my body, making me nervous. As I approached the second site, I calmed down slightly when I noticed a woman there with a child of about two years old. I walked closer and sat down on a bench not far from them. The baby was happily swinging on the swing, making a laughing noise that seemed a little strange to me. The woman was opposite the swing, and I called in to see her face. I sat for about 15 minutes, watching the still picture in front of me. Then I got up and walked closer sitting down on the bench next to the woman. She was wearing a long skirt and a sweater with sleeves, holding a handkerchief, mumbling something inaudible and crying, wiping her tears with a handkerchief. The little girl kept swinging on the swing and laughing with a laugh that didn't he sound like a child s. I tried to make out the woman as words. She spoke in jagged phrases. Give her back to me. Why? Why did you have to do that? She was everything to me and something like that. Story 4 Time swept by with invisible wings. Grandma passed away. I grew up, found a family, became a mother. My husband and I acquired a spacious dwelling. During the six years of being together, my husband and I avoided disagreements and resentments, but all good things sooner or later come to an end. I was afraid to even move, but the sound under the bed only intensified, as if someone was fiddling, grunting, sniffling. Suddenly I remembered my grandmother asked words about quarrels and houses. It became clear to me, we had awakened the house elf. But why did it come to me and not to my husband? For example, when I was a child, my grandmother used to say, Dante whisper, Dante shout, or Yuli disturb the sleeping house boy. And so, 30 years later, I accidentally woke him up. I grew up in joy and left her, spending a lot of time at my grandparents' house as my mom was always busy at work. They separated from my father when I was very young. Thoughts swirled around in my head, and the cold permeated my entire body. I lay on the bed as if paralyzed, unable to move. Suddenly, I thought someone was coming toward me. My heart raced to my heels, and I jumped up instantly, rushing into the kitchen. I was shaking with fear. What was that? I spent the rest of the night in the kitchen, half asleep, with the light on and the TV on. My attempts to please the housekeeper with sweets were in vain. Almost every night something fell off the shelves, dishes riddled, and when I cooked, everything seemed to jump out of my hand spontaneously, as if someone was pushing me under my elbow. Determined to take one last step, 
I put the baby to bed and sat in the darkened living room to try to talk to the houseboy. It might sound crazy, but I was so tired of these small but frightening events that happened in our house all the time. In my long monologue, I expressed all my feelings and emotions, shedding tears. I begged the housekeeper to stop scaring me and, on the contrary, to help bring calmness to the house. And he heard me. It was as if someone sat down next to me. At first my feet felt cool, but then they became very warm, as if someone had gently embraced me and warmed me. The excitement was gone. My thoughts cleared. I suddenly felt that everything was going to be alright. Since then, our meetings with my husband in the apartment became less frequent, and our conversations passed without scandals. Six months later we divorced and he left. I stayed with Mary in the apartment. The old domestic atmosphere returned and things began to settle down. Happiness returned to our family, though not completely. Perhaps there is hardly any family that is without conflict, but every time you raise your voice, remember that at one point it can bore even a houseboy. In the evening, my husband came home, but we didn't eat talk. He stayed the night, but we slept in separate rooms. Once again, the night was strange. Suddenly, around 2, 0 m, I heard some crunching under the bed. We don't have pets, and there are usually no rats on the sixth floor. I opened my eyes, but I couldn't see anything. It was completely dark, but the rustling under the bed was clearly audible. It was probably the scariest moment of my life. I was alone in the darkened living room, standing at the window and sobbing. My daughter was in her room. The apartment was dead silent. Suddenly, from the farthest corner of the room, I heard a barely perceptible rustle, and a shiver ran down my spine at the sensation of someone as presence. The thought flashed through my mind, it is not a person, it has something from another world. But I dismissed the strange thought at once. Mary, it has time for bed, I said quietly, turning to my daughter. In our seventh year together, we had a disagreement. I discovered that my husband was seeing someone else. Our domestic comfort began to disintegrate, and with it, the tranquility of our home. The walls shook with daily shouting and arguments. The children's laughter was replaced by tears. One evening, an argument with my husband reached a climax. We shouted at each other, and in the middle of the argument he shouted, I don't love you or this house. After which he slammed the door loudly and disappeared into the darkness of the night. My grandmother was a serious and deeply religious woman, and she also believed in various superstitions. In the evenings, she liked to give me fascinating stories and I was especially imbued with stories about the housekeeper, who protects the house from troubles, but only if you observe the unspoken laws of coexistence with him. Domovoy does not tolerate when you leave dirty dishes at night, is categorically against sitting on the doorstep, but most of all he is annoyed by shouting in the house. Family quarrels and noisy proceedings can wake up the house by and then he, like an angry bear, becomes fiery and seeks to expel those who have disturbed the peace. The room was empty. I went into the children's room and saw my daughter lying on her bed. I felt uneasy and had goosebumps all over my body. I called him to sleep and left the light on all night because my husband never came home for the night. I had a bad dream and was plagued with anxious thoughts. When I woke up early in the morning, I went to the kitchen. When I opened the cupboard, there were mugs spilling out of it as if someone had thrown them. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time, thinking that maybe I hadn't cleaned up well yesterday, although that was unusual for me. Then I took my daughter to the garden and, in a bad mood, went to work. I want to tell a story about a girl and her doll. Maybe it seems like you've heard something like this before, where a little girl gets a doll as a gift, and then something scary starts happening. But believe me, this is a different story. It all started in 2009 when I was 16 years old. One day, coming home from school, I noticed that a new family had moved into the house at the end of the street. They were a young married tandem with a young daughter who seemed to be about six years old. There was something strange about her clothes, a white dress, white socks and black shoes. Long black hair and a doll with the same outfit and hair created the effect of a miniature copy of the girl. Every day, coming home from school, I saw this little girl. She always sat outside her house, holding the doll in her hands and watching me as I passed by. Her gaze was cold and dark, which gave me strange feelings. She wanted to talk about the family that had moved into the house at the end of the street. You shouldn't mess with them, she cautioned me. 
They're not the kindest people. I've heard they're always on the move and don't stay anywhere for long. And their daughter. Do you know if she's adopted? There's something wrong with her. Rumor has it that she's some kind of devil spawn, and the doll she carries around isn't just a doll, I, but a demon created in her image and likeness. I just rolled my eyes and brushed off her words as the idle chatter of a crazy old woman. But how wrong I was. I wish I had listened to her warnings. A few days later, someone knocked on our door. When I opened it, there stood a young woman, the mother of that little girl with the doll. Hi, she greeted. I'm your neighbor, and I'd like to ask you a favor. Sure, I replied. What can I do for you? Something came up unexpectedly, she explained. I need to go out for a while, and my husband is going to be busy at work until late tonight. I'll only be gone for a few hours, but I need someone to watch my daughter while I'm away. I know this is unexpected, but could you take care of her? Sure, I agreed. What's your daughter's name, Lisa, the mother replied. We should be leaving now, so if you don't mind. I followed the woman to her house and waited while she ran upstairs. When she returned, she was holding the hand of a little girl. As soon as I saw her, I was stunned. There was something wrong with her. Her eyes were completely black, like a shark's, and she was still clutching that poor doll in her hands. I couldn't figure out what it was about it that made me so horrified. Perhaps it was the fact that the doll was an equally creepy replica of the little girl. Before I could back up, my mother said goodbye, got into the car, and drove away. Silently, little Lisa took my hand. Her skin was icy to the touch, and goosebumps ran down my back. Play with me, she said. We went upstairs to her bedroom, but as soon as I closed the door, I was strangely uneasy. The room suddenly became hard to breathe in, and I could smell a foul odor, and I could smell a foul odor, and I couldn't make out where it was coming from. I played with Lisa for about 30 minutes, but then I felt a tightness in my chest. Cold sweat poured down my throat and my stomach rumbled. I felt like I was going to turn inside out. I have to go now, I mumbled. Suddenly, Lisa jumped to her feet and screamed, you're going to stay with me forever and we'll play all the time. Her cold black eyes pierced me and I felt like I was going to pass out any second. I tried to get out of the room out of fear, but the doorknob wouldn't turn. I pulled on it, but to no avail. Then I ran to the window, but even that wouldn't budge. I tried desperately to open it, but the door and window remained locked. Remembering the old woman's warning, I cursed myself for not listening to her. I was trembling with fear, but I decided to say a prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name after I said that. The girl let out a shrill cry that almost made me deaf. I put my hands to my ears to stop the sound, but continued to repeat the prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Both on earth and in heaven the girl dropped the doll and it flopped to the floor. Suddenly she came to life and attacked me, denashing her teeth and clawing at me like a wild animal. I tried to push her away, but she jumped up on my neck and tried to bite me. I flopped down on the bed, fighting the doll with all my might. It was a real fight. The doll was thrashing, clawing at me, tearing at my clothes. Her grip on my neck made it hard for me to breathe. In the end, I got the upper hand. Grabbing her legs, I slammed her head against the wall with force. The impact was so hard that it left an imprint in the wall. The doll snapped in half, black smoke billowing from it. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The doll lay on the floor, shaking and wriggling like a dying fish. 
The crack in the doll's head grew wider and wider, and thicker and thicker smoke rose from it. And do not expose us to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen after I finished praying. Lisa lay unconscious in the middle of the room, and the doll had turned into a steaming pile of melted plastic, sizzling and bubbling on the carpet. At that time, Lisa's mother returned. She ran up the stairs and burst into the room, demanding an explanation. I tried to explain, but the words stuck in my throat. In the end, I just collapsed to the floor. When Lisa came to, she said she didn't remember anything. I looked up at her. The black eyes were gone, and now they were bright blue. Three years later, when Lisa was only nine years old, she died suddenly. After drinking an entire bottle of bleach, she was corroded from the inside out, gone in terrible agony, screaming and crying in agony as her organs slowly deteriorated and dissolved. Doctors considered it an accident, but everyone suspected she had committed suicide. Her parents were desperate. No one could explain why such a young girl would take such a step. A week after the funeral, her parents left the house. There were too many bad memories in it. As they were going through Lisa's bedroom, packing up her things, they noticed something taped to the back of the mirror. It was a picture of Lisa and her doll. On the back was written in childish handwriting. She has returned to us. For those who answer our call will be damned forever. Story 2 After my wedding, my wife and I decided to honeymoon in Ireland. For this purpose, we rented a cozy cottage in a small rural village in the south of the country. The cottage was a four-room stone building with ivy-covered walls. It represented the perfect setting for our country vacation. The owner of the cottage was a local woman named Mrs. Gorman. She came every day to take care of us cook dinner and clean up. We became fast friends with her, and in the evening she treated us to old Irish ghost stories and folklore. There was a huge, lonely church in the immediate vicinity, and we often went there in the evenings when the light was beginning to fade little by little. The path leading to the church wound through the woods and ended at the cemetery walls. It was called the Burial Path, because it was the path where corpses had been transported for burial many years before. The church had a massive oak door that was never locked. Inside, huge stone arches led off into darkness, and moonlight streamed through exquisite stained glass windows. In the corner of the church, to the right of the altar, was a niche where a gray marble statue stood. It was the figure of a knight in armor, lying on a stone slab and holding a huge sword. In the dim light of the church, this marble statue seemed to be surrounded by a terrible glow. No one knew the name of this knight, but it was rumored that he was an extremely evil man who had done such terrible things that he was cursed by God and his house where he lived was struck by lightning. Looking at the stern, sinister face carved in marble, it was easy to believe that it was a depiction of an evil man. However, I wondered why his statue was on display in the church. For the first two weeks of our honeymoon, everything was perfectly calm and beautiful. During these days, I was painting and my wife was immersed in the writing process. It was the happiest time of our lives. During the day, I would create beautiful landscapes on canvas and my wife would express her thoughts in a sketchbook. In the evenings, we sat around the fire, enjoying stories of banshees, dull hands, and other mysterious creatures that crept into our dreams. But then something changed. One day, Mrs. Gorman came to us with a serious expression on her face. She announced that she was going away for a few days, but she did not specify the reason for her departure. My wife was not happy about this news, for now she would have to cook the lunches and wash the dishes herself. 
I kept pestering Mrs. Gorman with questions about the reasons for her departure, and finally she gave in. Perhaps I should tell you, she whispered quietly. There are legends around this house. They say much evil has been done here. What I've heard is enough to make the blood freeze in my veins. If you've been to church, you may have seen the large marble statue next to the altar. You mean the knight in armor, I asked. That sinister image carved in marble she spoke of, I began. The story goes that on Halloween night that creature sits on its pedestal as if it has risen from the dead, and when the church bell rings eleven times it steps out into the darkness, stomping across the graves and all along the alleys of the tombs. You don't really believe that, do you, I asked. Naturally, she interrupted because I know people who saw his footprints on the trail the next morning. And where is he headed, I asked. What do you think she snorted? This way to our house. After all, he lived here when he was alive, right? And they say trouble to whoever crosses his path. If you're smart, you'll heed my advice. Keep your door locked on Halloween night and don't open it for anyone, no matter what. She was silent after that, refusing to speak on the subject again. When she left, I didn't tell my wife about the legend of the figure that roamed the marble. I didn't want to scare her. Halloween night came and I made dinner for my wife to please her. We sat by the fireplace, enjoying a bottle of wine. Outside the window, the sunset was fading and a thin white fog hovered around the house. Around 10 o'clock, my wife noticed that she was tired and was going to go to bed. I felt a little restless and decided to go outside to get some fresh air. Leaving the front door unlocked, I went outside. A strange gray light appeared in the sky. I walked slowly, marveling at the beauty of the night. There was complete stillness, no birds trilling, no noise of running hares, not even the faint rustle of branches. Behind the treetops, the black and gray church tower stood out against the night sky. When the church bell struck eleven, I looked out the window and saw my wife asleep on the sofa. I decided to take a little walk, so I went outside. As I walked along the path leading to the church, I thought I heard a rustling behind me. I slowed my steps, listening, and the noise stopped. As I continued on my way, I suddenly heard footsteps. A strange feeling of pursuit came over me, but when I looked back, there was no one there. When I arrived at the cemetery, I noticed the church door was open. I decided to go in. As I walked down the hallway, I suddenly felt a chill, remembering that this was the night when, according to legend, the marble statue came to life. Under the pale light of the moon, I noticed something that made me freeze. My heart sank into my heels and a shiver gripped my body. The marble statue was gone. The slab where it had stood was empty. Am I going to go crazy? Could this be some kind of evil joke? But then a horror swept over me. A terror that made me feel nauseous, completely consuming me a premonition of impending doom. I sprinted out of the church, jumped over the cemetery wall, and rushed down the path. As I ran, a dark figure emerged from the shadows, seemingly blocking my path. Who are you, I shouted. A figure stepped out into the moonlight, and I saw that it was the local priest. What happened, he asked. The marble statues disappeared from the church, I exclaimed. He only hummed and replied, I think you're too caught up in your grandmother's fairy tales, I'm telling you. I saw it with my own eyes, I stated. They disappeared. Well, come with me and see the priest, replied. We headed back down the path, climbed over the cemetery wall, and returned to the church. 
The place was quiet and peaceful, like a tomb. There was a smell of dampness and fresh earth in the air. Together we walked down the aisle, and I pressed the lid to my eyes, knowing that the statue would no longer be there. Here they are, the priest said cheerfully. I opened my eyes. He was right. In front of me lay a huge marble figure on its pedestal. I took a deep breath. Perhaps it was just a reflection of light, I suggested. The priest ducked down and looked closely at the statue. You see, he said. The arm is broken, and so it was. When I got home in the evening, the cottage was dark. My wife was nowhere in sight. Turning on the light, I noticed her legs protruding from behind the sofa. She was lying in a pool of blood. I fell to my knees and cried. She had been murdered. Her head was crushed, her brains leaking out onto the floor. I grabbed her hand and noticed that something hard was clenched tightly between her cold, dead fingers. I unclenched her fist to see what she was holding. It was a gray marble finger. Story 3 When I was in high school, my best friend Jessica loved scary stories, ghosts, and urban legends. She seemed to know all the creepiest stories she could find and claimed to have read about all of them on the scary website she constantly visited. Back in the day, we all loved to listen to the various spooky stories and urban legends she told us. Thanks to her, all my friends learned about the woman with the slit mouth, Kashima Raiko, and other weird Japanese legends. Some of them really creeped me out. One day Jessica invited me and our friends Margaret and Sophie to spend the night at her house. In the evening, right after school, we all followed Jessica home and went up to her bedroom. She started talking about a new Japanese legend she had read and suggested that we make a Japanese version of the Kokuri-san board with her. I declined, saying I didn't want to get into the occult, but she assured me that it was just a game she'd seen on the scary site and that it didn't involve summoning demons. However, let's use a silver coin for precaution, Sophie suggested. Okay, but why Jessica asked? I've heard that playing on the Ouija board with a silver coin keeps you safe from possession, she replied. Luckily, Jessica's mother had a coin collection, so she pulled one of the silver coins out of its case and brought it into the bedroom. We sat in a circle on her bedroom floor while Jessica drew letters and numbers on the board. When she was done, she put a coin in the middle of the board on top of the strange wavy red shape she had, she had drawn and we started playing Kokuri-san. Each of us touched a finger to the silver coin, and Jessica shrieked Kokuri-san, Kokuri-san, please come and play with us. The rest of us had never experienced this kind of game before, so we really didn't know what to do. When the coin suddenly started moving, we were all amazed. Soon we got involved and started asking the spirit as many questions as we could think of. Which one of us likes Jared more, me or Jessica, I asked excitedly. Coin moved quickly across the board and wrote my name. I suspected as much I exclaimed with joy, but Jessica remained unsatisfied. We all smiled dully at each other as if we had just found a new playmate. But as we asked the spirit more and more questions, I noticed something unusual. Every time we asked the spirit something, Instead of a simple yes or no, it always answered okay. This made it tricky to figure out what the spirit really meant. As we continued the game, it got dark outside and we finally ran out of questions. We decided to call it a day and head home. Jessica insisted that it was important to finish the game properly or else trouble could happen. Kokuri-san, 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 Please go back to the other world, she shouted. The coin fell on the letter O, then on the letter K. It's not, Jessica said in an agitated voice. 
It should be yes, ask him again, I suggested. Kokuri-san, Kokuri-san, please go back to the other world, Jessica demanded. Again, the spirit replied, okay. He was supposed to go to DA and then stop at the red gate of the Tory, Jessica whispered. But he didn't, we all tried to convince the spirit to return to the other world, but it was no use. He just kept saying, okay. Did you come home, Jessica asked. Okay. Did you really come home, she insisted. Okay. Please leave, she shouted. Okay. No matter what we said, he did not back down. The movement between the two letters gradually accelerated, and finally the silver coin darted between them with astonishing speed. All we had to do was keep our fingers on the coin. We were all in shock. The spirit seemed to be out of control, taking over the board and the coin, and none of us could stop it. We sat and watched in horror as the silver coin rolled back and forth over and over again. Okay, 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 all four of us went into a state of panic. Margaret and Sophie cried, and Jessica opened her eyes wide, tears glistening in them. My heart was beating so hard it felt like it was ready to jump out of my chest. I can't take it anymore, I shrieked. Everyone looked at Jessica. Okay, she shouted, taking control of the situation. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to take our fingers off the coin at the same time. We instantly agreed. Okay, on the count of three, she said. One, two, three. All the girls took their fingers off the coin at the same time. All except me. I don't know why, but it felt like my finger was stuck to a silver coin. I just couldn't let go. The coin kept sliding back and forth at breakneck speed. I was so scared I couldn't even think. I burst into tears and started screaming, what's happening, help me, over and over again. Me. It was the scariest thing I've ever experienced. Arise. You need to. Abawa, and then, silence descended. Those final utterances lingered, the tall, shadowy figure's voice fading as a white curtain veiled my vision, transforming the once familiar surroundings into an infinite expanse of snow. As my eyelids lifted sluggishly, they met the luminous gaze of the full moon casting its ethereal glow upon my pallid complexion. A chill crept over me as I lay upon the cold ground my senses assaulted by the throbbing ache in my head and the sticky sensation of blood and mud on my hands. Panic surged through me as I struggled to piece together fragments of memory, bewildered by my presence in the depths of a forest. My heart raced like a frantic drumbeat, yet strangely, the frenzy subsided quickly. It struck me as ironic that amidst my amnesia, my inherent timidity remained a vivid recollection. The darkness enveloped me, a formidable presence in the solitude, particularly unsettling amidst the dense embrace of the forest. Each towering pine seemed to whisper secrets to the stars above. Alone in this eerie landscape, my instinct urged me to seek the nearest escape route from this unsettling realm. Yet, a curious calm settled over me defying the expected terror. Despite the usual dread such isolation would evoke, an inexplicable sense of belonging washed over me, as if I had stumbled upon my intended destination. In the obscurity there was an odd comfort, a strange familiarity that defied logic. Trusting my instincts, I pressed forward with determination. After trekking for what felt like an eternity, an eerie silence blanketed the surroundings, a stark contrast to the expected cacophony of the wild. It was a testament to the mind's ability to deceive. 
Hours passed before a colossal mansion loomed into view, a beacon of potential salvation. With renewed hope, I hastened toward it, only to be confronted by a disconcerting illusion. Despite my desperate strides, the mansion seemed to recede, a mirage mocking my pursuit. Exhaustion gripped my weary limbs, causing me to collapse once more, the fleeting image of the mansion fading into oblivion. As consciousness returned, the sensation beneath me hinted at something other than the familiar ground it was wood, sturdy and unyielding. Standing upon the mansion's wooden porch, confusion clouded my thoughts. How had I arrived here? Nothing seemed to align logically anymore. Intent on seeking answers, I approached the imposing Gothic door, only to be halted by the sight of my bruised hand, still stained with blood. An unwelcome sign of suspicion. Fortunately, the nearby lake offered a solution as I cleansed my hands in its icy embrace. Returning to the mansion, I cast a lingering gaze upon the moonlit lake. Its ethereal beauty was undeniable, shrouded in mist, with the moon's reflection dancing upon its tranquil surface. Yet, a profound silence hung heavy, lending an unsettling chill to the scene. Every detail, from the twisted shapes of the trees to the wintry backdrop, painted a haunting tableau. In that moment I felt akin to a lone wolf, adrift in a world foreign and forbidding, with only solitude as my companion. After contemplating in my transcendental state, I resolved to return to reality and headed back to the house. With each step, my heart resumed its heavy beating, its rhythm reverberating loudly in my ears. Here I stood before the door, consumed by curiosity as I surreptitiously listened. Silence enveloped me, broken only by the eerie wail of the wind, stirring an unsettling sensation within me. Tremors ran through me as I hesitated, raising my hand to knock, but before I could, the door creaked open of its own accord. It was as though the house beckoned me forth. Hello? Is anyone here? I uttered, my voice trembling as I crossed the threshold. Stepping into the dimly lit space, it became evident that the house had long been deserted. Judging by its grand windows and antiquated architecture, it seemed to hail from the 1920s. The longer I lingered, the more unsettling the atmosphere became. To my right loomed a cobweb-covered fireplace, while to my left, purple drapes allowed the moonlight to cast half the room in an eerie glow, leaving the other half shrouded in darkness. At the far end, a rusty metallic door beckoned, yet as I approached it, an unnerving sensation of being watched crept over me from the shadows. It took considerable effort to wrench open the creaking door, its chilling touch sending shivers down my spine. Inside the smaller room, a lone desk with a solitary drawer stood before me, and above it, a mirror hung on the wall. As I reached for the drawer, my gaze met my reflection. My God, I gasped inwardly. My face and neck bore numerous scratches, as though I had been viciously attacked. Horrified, I tore my gaze from the mirror and opened the drawer revealing only a small black and white photograph. Straining to discern its details in the dim light, I beheld a family portrait. Clad in Victorian attire, each member wore an expression of subdued happiness. I studied them one by one, from the loving mother to the diligent father, the eldest son, and the Da. With trembling hands, I hastily returned the photograph to the drawer my entire body quivered violently as I stared at the image of the little girl, her expression eerily devoid of emotion. Overwhelmed by fear, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Without hesitation, I pivoted and shut the door behind me, seeking solace in the barrier it provided. Do you ever experience that sensation where fear grips you so tightly that you instinctively shut your eyes, yet your curiosity tugs at you? compelling you to open them again, 
despite knowing full well the regret that will inevitably follow. That's exactly how I felt. As I lifted the photograph for a closer inspection, I caught sight of the little girl in the mirror, standing directly behind me. Unlike before, her face wasn't vacant instead. It bore the most unsettling expression I had ever witnessed. With an elongated face that seemed to sway eerily from side to side, her jaw hung slack, and her eyes resembled two immense lumps of coal, devoid of any trace of mercy. Her scalp was concealed beneath a thick veil of greasy black hair, the longest I had ever beheld. Clad in a small, soiled nightgown, she revealed limbs of a pallid, bluish hue. My scream died in my throat as her foul odor assaulted my senses, causing me to gag. She locked her gaze onto mine through the mirror, paralyzing me with fear. Desperate to flee, I found my legs rooted to the spot. With grotesque stick-like limbs, she lurched forward, her scarred arms contorting against the wall. As her hair fell out in clumps and her decaying flesh oozed, any semblance of sanity within me vanished. I recalled the door on my right and surged towards it fueled by adrenaline. This time, opening it posed no challenge. Inside, the room mirrored its predecessor a solitary desk and a mirror. Peering into the reflective surface, I beheld the small girl huddled behind me. Unlike the ghostly tales of my youth, she charged at me with fury. My heart raced as I darted for the next door, finding another room identical to the last. Despite the eerie repetition, I couldn't dwell on it. Each glance into the mirror revealed the girl, inching closer with a menacing gaze. Her presence warped my thoughts, driving me to madness. In a frantic moment, I leaped out the window, fleeing her haunting reflection. Disappointment washed over me as I realized I was still breathing. Her presence was unbearable, yet there she stood, unmoving, her gaze filled with seething fury through the window. From afar, she resembled the figure in the photograph, pallid and eerie. I wished for nothing more than to surrender to oblivion, but then she leaped. The sickening thud as her body hit the ground echoed in my ears. Slowly she rose, resuming her menacing posture. Each step she took served as a grim reminder of the torment ahead. Was this a nightmare? It had to be such madness defied the boundaries of reality. Lost in contemplation of the unfolding events, I was abruptly brought back to reality as she approached. Her presence beside me, the sound of her breath, and the unmistakable scent of death that surrounded her served as stark reminders of her undeniable reality. I screamed until my throat ached, but she remained unfazed. Why hadn't she ended it already? What was she waiting for? Exhausted from my futile efforts, I fell silent and still. Life felt meaningless after enduring such horrors. My mind was forever scarred I knew my time had come. Then, she lowered herself until her face was inches from mine. With a final breath, I closed my eyes, ready to embrace whatever awaited beyond. It's all right, my son. We forgive you. Just come back to us. That voice. I know that voice. It's my father's. As I gradually opened my eyes, the blur cleared, revealing familiar faces my devoted, industrious father and my stunning mother. Yet they were in tears, their eyes bloodshot from the torrents that had soaked my bedsheet. Where am I? This isn't my room, the machines beeping beside me clearly don't belong to me. Why is my arm restrained with handcuffs to the bed? Panic surged through me and tears streamed down my face beneath the oxygen mask. It didn't take long for an explanation to emerge. Pop retrieved a newspaper from Mom's handbag, and the headline on the front page left me numb. Young girl killed in car accident. Hit and run tragedy. Drunken teenager crashes into tree. Knock. 
A dark figure eased open the door and slipped into the room. My still wet eyes struggled to make out his distorted features, but an eerie smile lingered on his face. I glanced at my parents, but they remained oblivious to his presence. Now standing on the opposite side of my bed, parallel to my parents, yet they showed no sign of acknowledgement. His featureless visage was unmistakably human, despite its unsettling distortion. The perpetual grin etched upon it sent shivers down my spine. Shifting his gaze from my parents to me, he began to whisper, his voice a slow, ominous murmur. At last you're awake. Are you prepared? He seized my arm, his grin stretching wider as he repeated, Are you ready? I shut my eyes. Story 2 Welcome to Riverwood, the administrator greeted warmly, clasping the hand of the newest addition to the night nursing staff. Nestled in the heart of Millville, Riverwood stood as the sole nursing home in town, its origins tracing back to the early days when it served as a hospital. Its imposing presence, a three-story structure forming an elegant L-shape, was accentuated by a bell tower that now stood silent, its bell long removed. Perched atop a gentle rise overlooking the northern edge of town, Riverwood was ensconced in a dense thicket of trees, so dense that tales swirled of those who ventured too far and never returned. For years, Riverwood had been the refuge for the aged, the weary, the sick, and the hopeless, a place where many awaited their final moments. Stories whispered of darker times of experiments gone awry within its walls, but those chapters had faded into the past. Through numerous renovations and technological updates, Riverwood had transformed into a modern haven, a sanctuary offering simple living and constant care to those in need. Thank you, sir, the young nurse replied graciously, retracting her hand. I aspire to have a long and fulfilling tenure here. The third shift beginning this Friday will be your assignment Stationed on the third floor, West Hall, the administrator informed. Your companion for the night will be Emily, a young lady who will guide you through the premises upon your arrival. Once again, thank you, the nurse expressed her gratitude as they both stood up from their seats, and he escorted her to the door. Stepping outside, she gazed up at the imposing structure from the parking lot. It's quite beautiful, she murmured to herself though a faint shiver tingled down her spine. Despite its eerie aura, she was simply grateful for the employment opportunity. Times were tough, and with plans for a spring wedding, financial stability was paramount. Despite unsuccessful attempts at other nursing homes in neighboring towns, she found success here. Casting one final glance at the building, she climbed into her station wagon and drove down the driveway anticipation bubbling within her to share the news with her fiancé. Hello there, a voice greeted her as she ascended the final flight of stairs to the third floor. You must be Nancy, the new night nurse, the voice continued, belonging to a young woman a few years her junior. I'm Emily, she introduced herself. I'm your assistant. I'm currently studying to become a nurse, so until I pass my exams, I can only offer assistance. Together, they strolled the remaining distance. Emily guided her through the layout of the third floor, pointing out the location of the restroom and the staff room. Given their third shift schedule, they would often dine at their desks, as they were the sole occupants of the entire West Hall during those hours. This particular corridor catered to the most severely ill patients, with each room designated as a sick bay. The pervasive odor emanating from the hall was potent enough to induce nausea in even the most resilient stomachs. Emily's responsibilities primarily revolved around maintaining cleanliness in the rooms and tending to the patient's basic needs such as hydration, bathing, 
and feeding. On the other hand, Nancy's role encompassed overseeing medication administration and handling any critical decision-making processes that arose. During her initial week on the job, Nancy encountered the unfortunate loss of two patients, while a third teetered on the brink of death. Collaborating with the nurse from the third floor North Hall, they managed to revive the woman in critical condition. Despite their efforts, the woman remained distraught, convinced that her time had come and fretting over imagined repercussions. Perplexed by the woman's beliefs, Nancy eventually administered a sedative to ensure she could find some much needed rest. During a brief respite at the desk one night, the call lights outside empty patient rooms suddenly began illuminating, signaling a need for attention. Nancy and Emily investigated, only to find the switches untouched. It was at that moment that Emily decided to voice her thoughts. If you find this strange, brace yourself. You're still getting used to things around here. The night shift is when this place truly comes alive. What do you mean, inquired Nancy? Well, consider this Emily began as they made their way back to the nurse's desk. Working in a facility with the kind of history this one carries, where most arrivals don't depart alive, it's no surprise we encounter a few eerie occurrences. There's no shortage of them here. She paused, noticing Nancy's apprehension. I'm sorry, she added quickly. I don't mean to alarm you. You'll grow accustomed to it in time. They spent the remainder of the night engrossed in conversation, steadfastly staying by each other's side. Emily divulged the history of Riverwood to Nancy, which, despite occasionally unsettling her about her new position, reinforced her determination to persevere. She resolved to endure, understanding that a few spooky incidents wouldn't drive her to quit. Thus, night after night, she persisted. Despite the occasional odd occurrence, Nancy found herself gradually acclimating to her surroundings. However, it was that winter which posed a greater challenge for her. The snow accumulation in town was so dense that she couldn't fathom the severity of navigating to Riverwood. Nancy and her boyfriend resided a few miles from Millville, nestled in the quaint college town of Crestwood. While her workplace wasn't situated across the county, the heavy snowfall compelled her to opt for the highway route. Her car had skidded perilously close to the edge of the road on at least three occasions before she finally reached her destination. Upon arriving at work that night, she discovered that half of the already sparse night staff hadn't yet made it in. The radio was abuzz with reports about the weather, labeling it the most severe snowstorm in years, some were even calling it a blizzard. Nancy couldn't disagree the snow was nearly waist-deep already. She marveled at her ability to navigate through it in her station wagon, almost as if some unseen force had guided her there. All right, here's the strategy the charge nurse approached her during rounds. Chances are we'll be stuck here for a bit, so make any necessary calls home before the, before the phones go down. If the lights go out, the generator should kick in, giving us enough time to gather in the staff room. I'll provide further instructions if that happens. And don't forget to locate the flashlights for your hallway. As the nurse began to walk away, Nancy halted her. What about Emily? Has she arrived yet? No, you'll have to manage on your own for now. I'll do my best to find someone to assist you as soon as possible. If you require immediate help, just page me with that. She vanished through the doors. Nancy surveyed the nurse's station, mentally tallying the tasks ahead as she prepared to juggle dual roles. Securing flashlights, she placed one on her cart and ventured into the dimly lit corridor. The pill pass had gone smoothly, save for intermittent flickers. Peering outside, she glimpsed a whiteout, obscuring the view beyond the window panes. As she retraced her steps, lights faltered, then failed with a buzzing hum. Pausing, 
She anticipated the generator's activation, but silence persisted. Slowly advancing, she sensed a presence, unsettling in the darkness of the hallway. It could be the patients she pondered, perhaps they're curious about what's going on. Return to your room, she instructed. The storm has caused a power outage, but the generator will restore electricity soon despite her reassurances. Doubt lingered the generator should have already restored the lights. The person she had spoken to in the hallway must have heard her, as their presence faded away. Amidst the storm's cacophony outside, she strained to discern a distant tolling bell. Quickening her pace, she searched for her cart, illuminated by the flashlight. I offered them your presence, a chilling voice echoed down the corridor. She halted, scanning the darkness around her. No one was visible, no presence felt. Return to your room, she urged, her voice trembling slightly. The lights will soon illuminate the darkness. You snatched me away from them, but they're seeking retribution now, the voice declared. Nancy recognized it as belonging to the old lady they had revived. Please, lie down and rest, she pleaded tears welling in her eyes as she made her way along the wall towards the nurse's station. Each open doorway made her heart race. Then, the tolling of a bell echoed once more. A chilling draft brushed against her face like icy fingers. She longed for Emily's presence, a comfort in the darkness. Passing another open doorway, she was suddenly seized and pulled into the abyss. Her scream was stifled by the consuming darkness. Moments later, the generator roared to life, bathing the surroundings in light once more. Once the storm subsided and snowplows cleared the icy roads, a disconcerting noise caught the attention of the other nurses the phantom tolling of a bell that no longer existed. Concerned, several nurses ventured to the bell tower, only to discover Nancy suspended by a rope. As the wind swayed her lifeless form, her head struck the bell, its eerie resonance echoing through the hills. Amidst the chilling air, they swore they heard a sinister, high-pitched laugh, like icy fingers gripping their souls.